for your mercy never fails me. All my days have been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Lord, when we're going through trials and 
difficulties and tribulations, when relationships aren't right, when finances aren't right, when jobs aren't right, God, when things just don't seem like they're going like we would want them to go, Lord, our faith says that you are for us and that, God, you desire nothing more than for our hearts to turn to you. And so in good times and in bad times, God, it is our declaration that you are good, that you love us, and that your desire is for our best. So teach us some part of that today as we look into letting go of resentment. Lord, I pray that we would do the hard work of looking at those places in our lives, the deep recesses of our hearts where we're harboring anger and bitterness. And that, God, we would let it go. That, God, we would give those moments over to you, trusting you with our pain. So, Lord, help us to be open today to what your word says to us about those dark places, about that pain. That we might grow in faith and trust in our knowledge of so we give you this moment. Use it, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you guys so much for uh, that. I mean, that was a great job. I'm telling you, Rachel, that second song you sing is maybe one of the strongest songs I think we have in our little, you know, uh, library. And I love it every time. And just the declaration again and again as we say how God is for us. Um, I love that. Let's pull that back just a little bit, John. We're going to, yeah, about right there. There you go. I'm going to try to keep us on the carpet so my head doesn't get in the light. I don't know how tall you think I am. Oh, okay. Let me fix it then. Uh, okay. Like, baby Kevin's preaching today. All right. Anyway, um, all right. Well, a couple things before we get started. Welcome, Quincy, yet again. Come on. And, um, but let's start with Connect Card. Don't forget. It is super crazy important that we get connected each and every week. And so if you don't mind, either scan the QR code or you can simply text the word CONNECT to 832-703-0033. I was telling someone on Friday night, yeah, our church number. And I started giving out my cell number because I'm so used to repeating that as well. And I was like, no, no, wait, wait, that's wrong. You can't text me nothing. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, they were going to, anyway. So um, 832-703-0033, that's how you get connected to our church with the CONNECT card. If you do that, you will also get the notes. So my friends at home, don't forget to uh, do that as well. And then that's also how uh, we can put in our prayer requests. You can text the word prayer to that same number, 832-703-0033, and submit your prayer requests for, um, of course, we do prayerful Mondays on Monday evenings. And so if there's anything at all that we can be praying for you about. You know, I appreciate anybody that comes up to me on Sunday and says, will you pray for me? But you got to understand on Sunday morning, stuff flies out of my head. I just can't help it. I mean, I'm like, I'm thinking about this and that or whatever. So if you will put in the prayer request, then I will have it in front of me all week long, and I will remember to pray for you. So uh, always put that in. Text the word prayer. That's also how you can give to the church. You can text the word give or simply a number, uh, any number or denomination you choose, like, hey, I want to give 20 bucks or $200 or whatever. It's fine. You can text, text that number, same number, 832-703-0033. Are we not moving? Do we have any slides on any of these? Okay. I'm, I'm looking at the back. Let's just connect card. I didn't know if we had anything on the giving and all that stuff. All right, and then um, we do have one more event coming up this uh, month, and that is on the 25th. We're going to have our live prayerful Monday. It's prayer night, and so this is going to be at Janice's house, and so we're going to meet at about 6.30. We're going to go live at 7, which doesn't mean you have to be on camera. Somebody's like, do I have to pray out loud, and am I going to be on camera? The answer is no and no. Okay, you don't have to do any of those things. But nonetheless, we want to just meet in person and have a time of prayer. So we'll probably do about a 10-minute prayer live, and then we'll do another little something together in the room uh, at Janice's house. So I'm hopeful that you'll be a part of that. And, uh, and then we're out by 8. I mean, we're not staying any later than that because, you know, work and jobs and all that stuff. So we're going to be sure that we are out on time. All right. I think that's all my announcements. Anything else? I'm going to put that there. Is that all right? No. Oh. Thanks. Okay, cool. Well, <laughs> we'll deal with it. Okay, so <laughs> today we're talking about letting go of resentment. Last week we talked about letting go of regret, which deals with our past and things that we've done. This week talking about letting go of resentment, that deals with our past and things that have been done to us. 
And so when we talk about resentment, resentment really well usually deals with some kind of injustice that has been served upon us. This is something that happened to you, and it wasn't fair. And as you think back on it, you're upset that justice wasn't met in that time. We identify early on in life, right, with what's fair. We, our kids, I don't know where they learn it because I didn't teach it, but our kids talk about fairness. They'll say things like, that's not fair. I mean, I hear this at school all the time. That's not fair. And I usually applaud those moments. I'm like, good, you're really understanding that that's life. Life has never been fair. It's not fair. You know, it's really not. I have a, one brother, and he and I are about a year apart, and growing up, there was a lot of fairness that had to be considered by my parents. Um, you couldn't get one kid something without getting the other kid something, or else there's going to be chaos in the household. We would oftentimes have a color, like my brother's stuff was typically red, my stuff would be typically blue, and so we would know whose was whose, that type of thing. And so if we got one toy for a kid, we got to get another one. And God forbid there was only one piece of dessert left in the house, then it was like we have to go, you know, get our engineering tools, you know, weigh scales and stuff, make sure it was split perfectly down the middle. If, if the other brother cut it, then the other one got to pick which one, you know, it was that whole deal. Fairness was a big deal. So you're telling me house. your parents were communists? No, not at all. <laughs> Don't talk about my parents. No one laughed. All right, anyway, so... Um, she did. No. All right, so, um, but you know what? This whole, whole idea of fairness, it's really worse as adults, right? Because... Things become a little bit bigger. The injustices become a little bit bigger. It's not about desserts and things like that. We get over stuff like that, most of us. But, um, uh, you know, unless you grew up like that and then whatever. So anyway, but uh, for adults, when there's mistreatments in life as adults, it's really difficult to get over sometimes. When things aren't fair at work, when there's an injustice dealt uh, to us by someone in a relationship, that's really hard to overcome. You know, I had someone uh, I was on the phone with. We were, I was an old friend, and we were reconnecting, and, and um, they said to me, they said, Kevin, do you ever think, do you ever look around and wonder why it is that other people have it easier than we do, and why is it that we're always struggling with this and that? And I was like, yeah, all the time. I mean, I definitely can see that. I would love it if everything were easy, and you can, you can compare your life to someone else's. But I said to them, I said, but you know what? I know I'm right where God wants me to be, and I just have to trust in that. Whether it's fair, if it was, if, if life were fair, everybody would have the same things. We're, we, you know what? We're fine when life is unfair in our favor. We, you know what we call that? We call that a blessing. Oh, God really blessed me. I'm like, wow, why is he not blessing me like that? We, we love it when life is unfair in our favor. But when it's not, when it's unfair and it's not in our favor, when it's against us, when there's an injustice, that's where if we're not cautious or careful, we can get angry and we can get bitter and then resentment takes hold in our lives. And so, you know, when I was at the health club, I started thinking about, okay, when's the last time I was really feeling this idea or this felt this resentment? And, you know, I worked at the health club and, you know, you guys have been a part of that journey. And uh, when I was let go at the club, I was, I was actually quite resentful. I did everything that they asked me to do. I did all the things. They said, I, we needed to do this. And, you know, COVID has happened, and we're closing the club for a season, and now we're reopening, and all the stuff was happening, and we need to do this, 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 and this, and this. And after all that, it was decided that they wanted to move in another direction, you know, that old saying. Oh, we're, we're moving in another direction. I'm like, oh, okay. You mean hiring someone else? Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, we're going to hire somebody else to do the same thing you were doing. And, and I knew, I knew in my heart it wasn't me or my performance. I, it wasn't because I did everything they said to do. And I knew it was because this new GM, so I love my old GM, the general manager that was there before, but they moved this new guy in about a year before I was let go, and he wasn't doing well. And I knew this was part of his covering his backside, so to speak, is that, well, it's not going to be his fault, so it's got to be somebody's fault. And, and I was let go. And I mean, I was bitter about that. I was like, really, we're going to do this after all I've, you know, I've given my blood, sweat, you know, all the things that I've done for this club. And I'm going to be the sacrificial lamb because you don't want to take responsibility for where we are and all that kind of stuff. That was my perspective, you know. I mean, somebody else might say something different. But anyway, that's what I felt like. And so I was, I resented him and I resented his leadership. And I resented that they let that happen to me because there was other people in the company that knew that wasn't true. But the truth is, looking back, it was actually one of the best things that ever happened. I mean, I'm really 
grateful I'm no longer at the club. I really am. I'm, I'm very happy to be in the place where I am right now. You know, I had another little tiny sort of, maybe not resentment, but maybe just resent. I mean, it was just a little bit of resentment, not much. Uh, and that was this last year. So I came on at the school, and I got to know, so we, we teach in quads. There's like four teachers over here and four teachers over here. And so my team over here, that's where I was all last year. And for whatever reason, for no known reason, I got moved to this other quad. And I was like, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't really like that. I was comfortable over there. Why are you moving me? I didn't say it like that at all, but in my, this is all in my head. Okay, I'm saying it like that. I didn't say, I'm, on the outside, I'm like, oh, it's fine, it's fine. Uh, but on the inside, I'm like, what? I don't like that. No change. Anyway, so they got me moved over. And I was like, why am I doing this? And I didn't know until this week. Until this week. And I told you guys that as I'm in this new, you know, I've got three other teachers that I don't really know that well, and we're getting to know them. Um, one of the teachers in the quad said, I'm really glad you're here. And I was like, oh, yeah? And she said, yeah, I'm going through a really hard time. I'm going through a divorce right now. I'm not telling anybody about it, but um, I wondered why they moved you over here, and God told me this is why, because I need you, because I need somebody here. And I was like, oh, so it had nothing to do with me, right? I mean, it really, why am I, why am I taking this moment of, of, to reflect on, this is unfair to me, when God was like, I am putting you in front of the people you need to be in front of right now. Would you settle down? Now, remember, I put my own voice on God, and that's not how he says that. But, you know, <laughs> but in my, in my heart, this is what he says to me, right? And I'm like, you're right. I mean, you're right. I am right. I got, God, I have to trust you. I have to trust. You're doing what you want to do with my life. And if I'm really a Christ follower, I have to give him free reign, right? I have to give God control. If I'm really going to do that, and, and, and when we do that and when we walk in faith, it really takes away our opportunities to be resentful. It really does. Because these injustices are oftentimes God doing what he wants to do in order to put us where he wants us to be so that we can be that man or woman of God in that place. And we're like, it's not fair, it's not fair, and it's all about me. And when I'm all egocentric, then yeah, resentment really happens until I learn to trust God, until I learn to trust him. So today we're going to look at Jonah chapter 4. And in Jonah chapter 4, we see a very bitter and very resentful person. We're not going to put that up right now. We're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about this, all right? Um, so in Jonah chapter 4, God is dealing with a very resentful person in Jonah. Well, there's a lot of background to it, so I'm going to turn it over to Quincy. Quincy, tell us a little bit about Jonah. So most of us have probably heard of the story of Jonah and the whale, Jonah, you know, Jonah and the fish. This is a very popular Bible story. It's when we tell children. Um, and we get the entire book of Jonah wrong in a lot of ways. Jonah is a priest. Jonah, it, the book of Jonah is not about a fish. It's about a priest of God who is very hateful. And the book is not even about Nineveh repenting. It's about Jonah repenting. Okay, so Jonah is the center of this book. Jonah is a priest. Which, in, uh, to be a priest in Israel in the days of the temple meant you were getting steak dinners every day. <laughs> you would think that. Be, well, that's, that's it, it's a good life. Yeah. You can't own anything, but every time somebody brings a sacrifice, you get to eat some steak. Mm -hmm. Right? What a good life. Right? This is a great life. And God tells Jonah, hey, I want you to go to Nineveh and preach because I'm going to destroy Nineveh unless they repent. Now, Jonah... Is like, no, I don't want to do that. Now, Jonah hates Nineveh. Now, this is a part of the story we don't really get a lot of times. We think Jonah hates Nineveh without cause. No. Israel and Assyria are at war, right? They've been at war, or they're going to be at war for 200 years. This is towards the beginning of that time period. But Israel and Assyria are going to be at war. Uh, Assyria is a very vile, very terroristic type country. They will go into your city. They will kill, torture, anything they can do to scare the future generations into submission to Assyria. Guess what the capital of Assyria is? Nineveh. Nineveh. So 
in this, when you read the story, think, think this way. Jonah likely had friends and family that were killed by Ninevites. Likely had people he knew whose lives were completely destroyed by Ninevites, by the Assyrians. This would be like being a New Yorker on 9-11, 2001, standing there on the out, outskirts of New York, seeing friends and family die, and then God saying, hey, I want you to go to the Taliban and preach, and I'm going to save them. This would be like uh, being a Polish Jew in 1940s and seeing your friends and family running for your life from Nazi Germany and God saying, hey, go to Berlin and preach to Hitler, and I'm going to save him. Well, it's even, it even goes a little bit further than that. God says, I'm going to destroy them unless you go. Yeah. And so you're like... <laughs> All right. Destroy them. I'm, I'm up with this plan, right? <laughs> right. Let them die. I, I mean, you know. cool. I just need to not go, and they're dead. And everything awesome. I want just happens. Yes. You know. <laughs> but so this is the situation Jonah's in. Okay. Now we see the heart of God here telling Jonah, I want to save them. And we see the heart of Jonah saying, no, I want vengeance. I want them destroyed. You know, these analogies show the depth of human resentment. You might not want Hitler to be saved. Who here in this room wants Hitler to be saved? Come on, that's a loaded question. Right? Well, I mean, that's... <laughs> right? So who here in this room wants the Taliban to be saved? I would love it. Right? Jesus would. We should. But we don't think that way. We want vengeance. You know, his resentment was not unfounded. It was well-placed. He had good reasons to hate Nineveh. But God still loved Nineveh. And so he basically says, I would rather go die in the wilderness. I would rather leave my good life and go be a hobo somewhere in some faraway land than uh, ever go to Nineveh and save them. That's the heart of Jonah. So in Jonah chapter 3, verse 10, it says, God saw their actions, Nineveh, and they turned from their evil ways. So God relented from this disaster that he threatened to do to them. He did not do it. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became furious. This point that is, um, or the point being is that the real reason of Jonah's resentment, uh, when the Lord relented from his destruction against Nineveh, Jonah was very displeased. He wanted these people to suffer, and rightly so. He wanted them to suffer, and God is not going to make them suffer. So it comes back to that idea of justice. I mean, Jonah wanted justice. These people were evil, and they had been evil against God's people, against God. I mean, they were a godless, heathen, evil people. And he's like, why would I not want them to just wipe off the face of the earth? We don't want them saved. God, come on. We want them destroyed. He wanted justice. And in the same way that we want justice for those inequalities in our life, for those moments when, when life hasn't been fair to us, be it how, where we were born, be it, be it uh, you know, our socioeconomic status, be it um, just the fairness of what happens at work, the little things. Sometimes we allow this resentment to take hold, and God cannot move us forward in faith when we keep looking back and holding on to the past and saying, this was unjust, and God, you need to fix it, or else I can't move forward. And God's like, I can't use someone as my instrument who continues to bear this resentment like this. And God tells us to let it go. And so let's look and see how he continues to deal with Jonah. He starts giving some object lessons. to, And I love this chapter. So we're all about the fish and the miracle of, of you know, that three days in the belly of the fish or the whale. And he vomits them out and, and he preaches and Ninevites saved. And we, sometimes we just stop reading Jonah before we get to chapter 4. But chapter 4 is really where it's at. Chapter 4 is really where God does his work. It says in, in verse 2, it says, he prayed to the Lord. This is Jonah praying to the Lord. Please, Lord, isn't this what I said while I was still in my own country? That's why I fled toward Tarshish in the first place. I knew that you are a merciful and compassionate God. He is mad that God is merciful and compassionate. He loves it when God is merciful and compassionate toward him. But God, I am angry when you're merciful and compassionate toward others. Toward the people I don't want you to be. And isn't it true sometimes when we compare our lives toward others? And we're like, God, why would you bless them? I should be blessed. Why am I not being blessed like that? And he says... <clears throat> I knew that you are merciful and compassionate, God, slow to become angry, rich in faithful love, and the one who relents from sending disaster. He is complaining about the character and nature of God. 
a priest. He says in verse 3, And now, Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah's a little dramatic. I'm just going to say this right now. I mean, he's a little on the drama I'm a clean. side. Yeah, it's a little on the dramatic side. But he is really upset. And he's like, God, just take my life. And I like God's continued response to Jonah the whole time is to ask him questions. It's like, hey, let's get some, let's think about your, think about what you're doing, Jonah. And I will, if you come to me for advice about someone else, I typically will say, let's look in the mirror before we look at someone else. I'm like, I'll talk to them about their stuff, but let's talk to you about your stuff. And Jonah in verse 4 says this, the Lord asked, is it right for you to be angry? And in that moment, Jonah doesn't answer. He doesn't give God an answer because the answer is obvious. No, it's not right for me to be angry. But God it says, is it right for you to be angry? And that's the first point we want to make. And we've kind of already made it, so let's just be sure we have that on the screen. It says, resentment doesn't want restoration. It wants vengeance. It wants its justice to be meted out. It wants, it wants fairness. It wants the scales put back in, in our favor, so to speak. It wants the scales like we want them to be, not how God chooses to be. And we have the whole list of who God is, merciful and compassionate and slow to be angry and rich in love. And if we're serving a God like that who has mercy, then guess what? He's going to withhold those moments where that person deserves that bad that they've earned, right? They've earned a bad, and God's mercy withholds that. And if that's who we serve, we've got to recognize that. Resentment doesn't want restoration. <clears throat> it wants vengeance. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says this. And this is all talking about um, as, as God's people cry out for the scales to be set right and for, for God to, to champion those who've been victimized and things like that. 1 Peter 3, 9 says this. The Lord does not delay his promise that he is a just God, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. So why hasn't God set things straight yet? Because he's patient. And he wants as many who will come to Christ to come to Christ. And, and that typically comes through a relationship with someone who understands the loving nature of God and who demonstrates that same grace and mercy that God does. And people say, I want what you've got. And you say, well, you know what? I just serve, I serve Christ. I serve Christ in me. And you can have that too. You know, if we're honest with ourselves, we can all think back to someone um, that we're resentful towards. We can think back to someone like an, an ex-wife you'd like to dang to heck. I told him to soften what he said when we were preparing this message. <laughs> <laughs> so only... You know, like we can, we can think about that. And if we're honest, a lot of us, we pretend, you know, we're not going to tell people what we really think inside. But there's people out there that we're angry at. You know, so this message is to all of us, but we have to learn to start loving people the way God loves people. You know, in the book of Jonah, it's fascinating that um, everything in the book of Jonah obeys God. Everything in the book of Jonah obeys God. The sea obeys God. The winds obey God. The sailors obey God. The fish obeys God. Nineveh obeys God. The tree obeys God. The worm obeys God. What in the book of Jonah does not obey God? man of God. He's the one that, that we should be resentful towards. If we're reading this story, we should be resentful towards Jonah, right? If we're going to be resentful and, you know, but that's put us, put ourselves in that situation. We're the ones that are disobedient, right? So everything that somebody's done wrong to me, I've done wrong to somebody else in some manner. I like to say this saying, and you can jot this down. Everybody's a villain in somebody's book. Doesn't matter how good you are, there's somebody out there that is resentful towards you, and you're resentful towards somebody. We have to learn to start loving people like Christ loved people. And so, as we continue down uh, the, the chapter 4 in verse 5, God starts an object lesson with Jonah. So Jonah doesn't answer God when he says, are you right to be angry? And it says in verse 5, Jonah left the city, and he sat down east of it. He made himself a shelter there and sat in, in its shade to see what would happen to the city. So I think he's there, he's like, I don't know. Maybe their repentance ain't as good as I thought it would be, and maybe God's going to go ahead and destroy it anyway. So he's like, okay, let's see what happens. And in verse 6, it says, Then the Lord God appointed a plant 
So God caused a plant. It said, and it grew up to provide shade over Jonah's head to ease his discomfort. Jonah was greatly pleased with the plant. Okay, this is where it gets, to me, it gets really kind of comical. And so we have like this little beanstalk moment where Jonah sits down and then a, and, and he's watching the city and it's a hot day. It's like a Houston, uh, if we had hills, he was up on a hill, but we don't have those. But it's like that. It was really hot and the wind was blowing and God causes a plant to grow up right next to him. And I'm sure he's watching the city going, well, maybe, you know, they didn't have, he didn't have a phone or anything he could mess with. So he's just watching the city, and, and, and then he sees this plant, and he notices it. And every time he looks down, the plant's bigger. And he's still watching the city, and then an hour later, it's like this high. And he's like, whoa, plant. This is pretty cool. And he starts watching the plant, and he can almost maybe actually see it grow. And it gets big enough to where it's giving him shade, and he's like, I love you, plant. There's, I have you, my best friend. You, we're, I will never leave you, and nothing's right in this world except you, plant. And maybe he names the plant. I don't know. It doesn't say. But he is, like, enthralled that this plant would grow up and give him shade. He's like, you're giving me all the things that I never had in life, and I just love you so much. And it eased his discomfort, it said, and Jonah was greatly pleased with the plant. And when dawn came the next day, so he fell asleep there. Maybe he was holding the plant as he fell asleep. You, we don't know. It said, when, con- when dawn came the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant, and it withered. Now, in my mind, Jonah's right there. I mean, would that not have taken care of a lot of problems for Jonah if he just, go away, worm? But, but it attacked, and maybe he was still asleep, and he got up, and he noticed that it had been attacked by a worm. But God appointed a worm, and it attacked the plant, and the plant died. The plant died, and it says in verse 8, as the sun was rising, God appointed a scorching east wind. So now the wind, God's like, okay, I took care of the plant, now here comes the wind. A scorching east wind, and the sun beat down so much on Jonah's head, Houston, Texas, uh, that he almost fainted, and he wanted to die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. Then God asked Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? They asked me if it was right for him to be angry about Nineveh. And I said, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Yes, he replied, it is right. So now he answers him, I am angry enough to die. Real dramatic Jonah, right? I mean, here he is. He's so, so dramatic. But here's the thing. When we have resentment in our hearts, and here's the next point we want to make. Resentment makes little things into big things. And it makes big things into little things. Let me explain. It makes little things into big things. It's like there's, when, when, when I have resentment and bitterness and anger and I have unresolved issues in my, in my past and I'm just, you know, I, I can make, it's like the little things that happen to me, I expand those into being these big things. Well, nothing's ever fair. It was a plant. It said he had made himself a shelter. I mean, couldn't he have gotten up there a little bit more or something else? I don't know, but he was just so upset about the plant. He made this little thing a big thing. Because if, when you're already in this really negative headspace, when you're already in this really negative place in life, then nothing goes right, even when things are. And I don't know if you know negative people, or if you are one of those negative people, but if things don't really go right ever, and we find ourselves complaining a lot, we need to check ourselves, we need to check our heart and go, okay, what have I not dealt with? Why am I living in this negative space? And the opposite is also true. So the little things, they're big things. It's like, oh, the drama of what happens to me. But then the things that we do that are pretty big things, we make them little things. Why? Well, because life's not been fair to me, so is it okay for me to be unfair to other people? Yeah, the big things I do, those should just be little things to the rest of the world because I cannot see the impact of my own actions because I'm filtering everything through the negativity that I'm living in. Listen to me. This is really important. I make the big things that I do into nothing. Shouldn't matter to anybody how I'm behaving right now because life has been super unfair to me. But that's not true. I cannot see the impact of my own actions. I'm filtering everything through the injustice of my own experience. Sure, I should steal from work. What did work ever do for me? Yeah, I should should treat that person that's serving me lunch poorly because they brought me the wrong dish and this is the third time I've come into this restaurant and somebody's gotten it wrong so they should get a piece of I should treat them like trash negative headspace negative space you know when somebody does something to make you angry 
when you first meet them. When you first meet somebody and they do something to make you angry, it doesn't matter what they do from that point on. You're always going to think of them negatively. Right? So when some, if you meet somebody uh, in a car wreck, right, they ran you off the road. And then, you know, two weeks later, you meet them at church. You're going to be sitting in church looking over that. You know, he ran me off the road. You know, and this is what it's like. Like that person could have went from running you off the road to going and feeding a thousand children and you wouldn't care because they ran you off the road. That's what it's like when you have resentment. You're going to think about that, that one thing, that little thing, and you're going to blow it up, right? Yes, you, you did me wrong. All the good you've ever done is now nullified. I don't care because you did me wrong. You know, and because you did me this one wrong, it's going to just make me forget every, all the good things you do. Even if the good things you do outweigh it at tenfold, it doesn't matter. Because in my heart, I'm resenting you. That's the problem with resentment. You know, this is kind of like what Jesus says to the Pharisees when he said, you're blind guides. You strain out a gnat, but then you swallow a camel. Right? So they were looking at little things and ignoring the big things. And this is kind of what resentment does. That's not really the context of that verse, but this is the, the, the concept. When you're resentful towards somebody... It changes the way you think of them, and you're not thinking of them right. You're not thinking of them as a human creation of God. You know, I'm guilty of this. I know I am, and I'm perfect in every way, so I, uh, the rest of you must be guilty as too. All right, Mary <laughs> So in Proverbs 19.11, it says this, a person's insight, I love this verse, a person's insight gives him patience. Think about that for a minute. When I begin to look at other people and I begin to try to understand where they're coming from, that person that brought me the wrong order or whatever, maybe it's their first day. Maybe they're having a terrible day. Maybe this is the third job they're working on that day, and they're exhausted trying to provide for their family. I don't know. But when I have insight, it gives me patience. When I understand where people are coming from, it gives me patience. And, and, and it says it is his virtue to overlook an offense. This is what God tells us. When it tells us that, you know what, we don't need to make little things into big things. They should stay little things. And we should look at our own self and say, you know what, I don't need to do big things and expect people to see them as small things. So in Jonah chapter 4, continuing, <clears throat> after he says, yes, I love that plant, kill me now. I no longer have my best friend plant, and you saved the city, and I'm upset with you, God. And Jonah's this, you know, in a bad place. Verse 10, so the Lord said, you cared about the plant which you did not labor over and did not grow. It appeared in a night and perished in a night. It's like you didn't have it the day before. You didn't grow up with this plant. This wasn't your boyhood plant. This wasn't a plant that stayed with you your whole life. And you're like, God, how dare you take away the plant that had been with me all my life? It wasn't even that. God's like, oh, my goodness, this plant grew up in a moment and died in a moment, and you can't get over yourself? He says, it appeared in night, perished in the night. Verse 11, should I not care about the great city of Nineveh, which has more than 120,000 people who cannot distinguish their right and their left as well as many animals? And you know that this, that's the end of the book of Jonah. Jonah ends in verse 11. This question ends the book of Jonah. God leaves us with that question. Should I not care about these people? They don't know. They think they're doing right. They think they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. It's all Assyria, and yeah, we're, we're the good guys, and we're conquering the world, and yeah, look at us. They think they're doing right. Should I not care about them, God says? And so here's the point we want to make in that, is that God wants us to see others like he does. And let me just throw this on there as well. He wants us to see others the way, way he does, including the person that hurt you, including the person that's hurting you right now. Including the person that when you think back and you're like, I'm just so embittered and enraged and resentful about that. And how is that fair? And how is it that they escape justice? And how is it that I'm being treated un unjustly? And yet they get to do that and I don't get to do that. And all these things that we say to God and we rail against God. And God's like, should I not care about them as well? And sometimes we're like, no. I'm your favorite. Why would you care about them more than you care about me? Maybe we don't say it exactly like that. You know, resentment 
shows us more about our own faults and failures than it does the failures of what we resent. When I'm resentful at one thing, the anger may lash out at other things. I might be mad because my team lost a football game. This turns to me being mad that there's a sock on the floor, which turns to me yelling at my children. See how that spirals out of control all because of one little thing? You know, the two things may be completely unrelated. But when you have resentment in your heart, the resentment creates a mess, and this mess spreads. We have to learn to let go of the resentment and clean out the mess instead of shoveling it around. You know, I can make a mess, and my resentment can be your mess because I'm going to bring it to you. You know, if, if you get something on your hands, imagine you have something dirty on your hands, and then you shake hands with somebody else, and they shake hands with somebody else. This is the way resentment works, right? I'm passing my anger, my bitterness along. I can sit here and complain about one thing to Kevin, you know, and then I'm changing the way Kevin thinks about that thing. Even though that whatever that is has never done anything to Kevin. I can alter the way that he's thinking about something because of my anger and my bitterness. That shows you something about me, right? This is how disease spreads, and resentment is a disease. You know, the Bible warns us of this very thing. Matthew 12, 15, it says, Make sure that no one falls short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness or resentment, same concept, springs up, causing trouble and by it defiling many. When you let resentment take hold, when you let anger and bitterness take hold, you're going to pass it around. And it becomes very difficult. It ruins families. It ruins churches. It ruins fellowships. We have to make sure, like, we have to be able to introspect ourselves and say, I need to let go of resentment. So this brings me to the question. Wait. So this brings me to the question. I think I'm jumping in. That's right. Okay. Yeah, so... It brings us to the question, how do I let go of resentment? It's okay. We neglected some in our notes. Uh, how do we let go of resentment? How do we do that? And so if you're keeping up with us in the back, we've skipped down a little bit. So um, how do we let go of resentment? And Ephesians 4 gives us the, the example. It gives us the example. It says, um, all bitterness, this is Ephesians 4.31, all bitterness, anger, and wrath, shouting, and slander must be removed from you along with all malice. God says, let's get rid of this stuff. And if you have it, then let's work on it. Let's work on getting rid of it. Let's pull it out. We, have you ever weed a garden? I hate, I hate weeding gardens. I'd much rather just grow grass and not gardens. But if you have gardens, you got to weed them, right? I mean, that's the deal. Or else they look awful. And God's like, I want you to root these things out. All bitterness, anger, wrath, slander, remove, along with all malice. Verse 32, and be kind and compassionate. So here's the flowers we're planting. These are the things that are pleasant. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. And so when we say we need to view others the way God views us, he forgave us. He loves us, even that person that did you wrong. And I have to let go of resentment, looking at others the way that God looks at me, and getting rid of bitterness, anger, wrath, shouting, slander, all that. Get rid of it. And be kind and compassionate and forgive just as God forgave us in Christ. You know, in the book of Ephesians, from about chapter 4, verse 17 on through chapter 5, Paul uses a rhetorical tactic of antithesis. Right? He's comparing two things. Don't do this, do this instead. Don't do this, do this instead. And you're supposed to understand whenever you're reading this that whatever he's telling you to do is the opposite of the first thing that he says not to do. So this being said, the opposite of anger, bitterness, wrath, shouting, slander, malice is compassion, kindness, and forgiveness. And a lot of times you say, well, I, I don't feel compassionate towards this person. I don't feel like I should you love know, this that person. That excuse bugs me all, to all get up. I don't feel. And remember, oh. if we're controlled by our feelings, we're never going to have the faith that we need to have. We cannot be controlled by our feelings. I absolutely hate the F word. Feelings. Feelings. I yeah, hate it. I, I, I am repulsed by the word. <laughs> you know, but so here's the thing. And, and but, you know, back to reality. If I don't feel it, fake it. You've all, we've probably all heard the saying, fake it till you make it. You know, this might be the case to do that. If I don't feel loving towards you, guess what? I should treat you lovingly anyway. You know, you may never truly let go of what that person did to you. 
but you can still treat them in a godly manner. You can still treat them like God wants you to treat them. And hopefully, the heart will follow suit. So regardless of whether I feel like loving you, I'm not commanded to feel like loving you. I'm commanded to love you. I'm commanded to do loving things towards you. And if I love you, if I'm treating you in the manner that God shows, like agape love is an action. It's something you do. It's not just a, it's not a feeling. So if I'm going to love you in a godly manner, that requires me to do something. And if I treat you in a godly, loving manner, hopefully my heart follows suit. If I'm, if I'm going to feed the, the starving person, I might not feel anything towards them. I might have zero emotional connection towards this starving child. But if I feed them and treat them like God does, that's what we're called to do. And maybe after I do so, I'll start remembering that child and I'll start loving that child. You know, and do this to your enemies, right? The Bible tells us to love our enemies. That means go and help your enemies. You know, I can, we, my favorite verse in the gospel is when Jesus is on the cross and he turns to the people that are actively hurting him and he says, Father, forgive them. That's what we should be like. Even while they're hurting us, while they're doing the thing that makes us resent them, we should still be, Father, forgive them. You know, I've always said that feelings follow faith. It's faith that leads out and feelings follow behind. When God calls us to do the difficult things, I don't remember ever feeling like, oh, yeah, I want to do the difficult things. <laughs> That's never been the case. But I know what I'm supposed to do, and I do it anyway, right? And then feelings follow faith. And so last thing is just to remember that, that letting go of resentment, letting go of those past injustices, it's a decision. It's a decision you choose. It's a decision you make. When uh, Ephesians tells us to let go of bitterness, anger, wrath, let it go. It's a decision I make. Now, here's the thing. It's not a one and done. It's not a one and We think, oh, well, I, I decided I would let that go. Why am I feeling mad right now? Because you need to let it go again. Guess what happens? It rears its ugly head and it starts to speak that voice and we get bitter and anger. If I go back and I want to go sit in that place where I was upset by being let go, I can start building up that anger resentment. Or I can say, you know what, I just need to do it again. I need to let go again and again and again. And what I do find is that the voice of the past begins to quiet over time. It gets less and less and less. We have to replace that resentment with compassion for others. Choose not to stay in that negative headspace any longer. I need, to, I need to trust that God is going to use that moment, whatever that may be, to put me in the place where he wants me to be, just like he did with me, just like he did with me in my vocation, just like he's done with me time and time again. He does the same with you. We have to trust in him that as he moves in our lives, even in the injustice, that God is good and he is for us in the good times, in the bad times, in the rejoicing, in the weeping, in the difficulty and in the ease, he is with us and he is for us. That's what we need to hold on to and trust and let it go. Let it go. Father, thank you for the opportunity to open up your word and deal with some difficult things. And, and Lord, as we, as we think in our past about those moments and, and spirit, you have a way of, when we start talking about these things, of sort of rooting that out and bringing it to the forefront. And in our hearts, perhaps there's some here this morning that as we've talked about someone who has done something wrong and, and injustice toward us, we thought that very same thing. You're like, yeah, that was them. And God, I'm so upset about that. And, 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 and those feelings have welled up even in this moment. And if not, then Lord, I pray it happen right now. I pray that anyone hearing this message in this moment would be reminded of that place where we're holding on to anger and bitterness and resentment. And you're calling us to be free, to be free from that, to be free from our past, to live in peace and to, to put on compassion and kindness and forgiveness just as you have put on compassion, kindness and forgiveness toward us. And Lord, life is not fair. And sometimes, God, you bless us with something that is an amazing thing. And other times, God, you, you allow us to walk through a hardship, but you do so with purpose and reason. So help us in the injustice to trust that you are a just God 
and one day you will set the scales straight, and that, God, you, you have our future in, in hand, and that you're not slow in your justice, but patient, and so we too should be patient. So, Lord, take this message, and as we go from this place, let us leave behind those things that are keeping us from loving others, from serving you. Let's let go of our resentment that people might see Christ in us. We thank you for that, and I pray all that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, thank you, guys.